this morning were found in Hebrews 10.23. And as we focus on just faithfulness, uh, specifically pastor's faithfulness, we, let's look about why we can be faithful. Verse 23 says, Let us hold fast that confession of our, um, of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. I think one reason why we can be faithful is that our God is faithful. Let's go ahead and start our worship this morning as we sing, To God be the glory. Let's stand as we sing, To God be the glory. To God be the glory, great things he had done. So loved he the world that he gave us his son. Atonement for sin And open the life gate That all may go in Praise the Lord, praise the Lord Let the earth hear His voice Praise the Lord, praise the Lord Let the people rejoice Oh, come to the Father Through Jesus the Son Patrick Odell with us this morning, President of Baptist Missions, and I've asked him to come if he would and open our time together in prayer this morning. It's a joy to have you with us. Thanks for visiting. Thank you. It's wonderful to be here on a special occasion Amen. and uh, to thank this church and your pastor for the wonderful partnership we enjoy with Baptist Missions and First Baptist Church of Wellington. We've known each other for about 13 years, and uh, you've served so faithfully on the Council of Baptist Midmissions, and currently he's serving as the chairman of our board, and I'm so thankful for that wonderful relationship. And so we wanted to be a part of this special day to just uh, celebrate God's faithfulness, but also your faithfulness to the Lord here at First Baptist. So it's my joy to be able to lead us in prayer this morning. Father, we come before you with hearts truly full of joy, the same joy that we just sang about, joy that causes us to say to God, be the glory, great things he hath done. Lord, we realize that we are all simply your servants, and we're amazed, Lord, that uh, we have the joy of, of knowing you as Savior and as serving you as King. And I just praise you this morning with this church family for the way you have used uh, the Alexander family and the way that you have blessed them and uh, the way that you have uh, been glorified by them and their ministry for you through this church. And so we rejoice in that today. And we pray for your continued hand of blessing, Lord, as this church shines brightly as a, a gospel lighthouse for Christ in 
uh, not just Wellington, but in this portion of the county, we pray that uh, many people might continue to come to know Christ as their Savior. We think even of the report of the fair ministry and pray that those seeds of the gospel would bear fruit in hearts and in lives and that people would be saved and receive Christ as their Savior as a result. Lord, help us to be faithful in, in sowing seeds like that. Help us to be bold in our witness for Christ, and we pray that you would use us in a in a way that gives you great glory. Continue, Father, to bless this service. May all that is said and done here today honor your servants and at the same time give you glory. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. As we think about faithfulness, one aspect of that is to follow Christ and being faithful in what he has given us. Sometimes we think of what's my future, but God only tells us to um, follow his word as it is the lamp unto our feet. And, and we'll sing together, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet. Let's take it one step at a time as we're faithful to our God. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. When I feel afraid, I think I've lost my way. We'll go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Our gracious Father in heaven, as we think about your faithfulness to us, it should cause within us a heart to be faithful to you. Let us daily set aside our will to your will, being faithful to every step of the way, using your word as our guide. Lord, as we think about your faithfulness, we think about your, think about your faithful provisions, all the many things you have bestowed and offered to us. Lord, as we think about, let's give back just a portion of what you have trusted us with. We ask that we will use this money to further the ministry here in Wellington locally, but globally around the world as well. We pray this in the name of your Son. Amen.
This is my father's world. Thank you, Sharon. I forgot you failed. Um, the, our church members know this, um, but you saw the offering went back um, through, and that is for our benevolence fund. We, um, our deacons, uh, grab that every um, does it. Uh, we do it every time we have communion. So if you missed it, please see uh, Miss Tiffany. If that's something you needed to put in the offering, I apologize for not giving the warning. Um, at this time, we're going to sing our last song before the um, challenge this morning. Jesus loves the little children. As Pastor said, we're focusing on children in the sermon. Um, children, we do not have children, church. So let's go ahead and sing this uh, well-known children's song, Jesus Loves the Little Children. Let's go ahead and stand as we sing. Jesus loves the little children. singing you may be seated On the journey of the narrow road And those who've gone before us line the way Cheering on the faithful Encouraging the weary Their lives a stirring testament To God's unstaining grace Surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses Let us run the race not only for the prize But as those who've gone before us Let us leave to those behind us The heritage of faithfulness Pass on through godly lives Oh, may all who come behind us find us faithful. May the fire of our devotion light their way. May the footprints that we leave lead them to believe. And the lives we live inspire them to obey. Oh, may all who come behind us find us faithful. 
after all our hopes and dreams have come and gone. Our, and our children sin through all we left behind. May the clues that they discovered and the memories they uncovered become the light that leads them to the road we each must find. Oh, may all who come behind us find us faithful. May the fire of our devotion light the way. May the footprints that we leave lead them to believe, and the lives we live inspire them to obey. All who come behind us find us faithful. May the fire of our devotion light the way. May the footprints that we leave lead them to believe, and the lives we live inspire them to obey. Oh, may all who come behind us find us faithful. All who come behind us find us faithful. Amen. Thank you so much, Pastor Glenn. That is a great message for each and every one of us as Christians. That those around us, behind us, find us faithful to the Lord. That is a special message to parents. May your children find you faithful. As we continue our study of the book of Ephesians this morning, I've canceled our children's church today. Now, why did I do that? Well, it's because today's passage is written directly to children. When Paul wrote this letter, he expected it to be read out loud in the church at Ephesus and eventually in many other churches as well. Paul expected there to be children in those church meetings where this letter was to be read. So take your Bibles, if you would, turn with me to Ephesians chapter 6. Kids, if you have your Bibles with you, I'd like you to open them as well. Ephesians chapter 6. You'll find in your bulletin an outline that will help you as we work through the passage this morning. The three verses that we will be talking about this morning are written specifically to children. Jesus loves the little children of the world. And through the Apostle Paul, God has given us something special to say to the children of our church. So I've titled this morning's message, Hey Kids, Listen Up. Got your attention, didn't I? I want you to listen carefully what God has to say to you this morning. And then I want you to do something about it. Moms and dads, grandmas and grandpas, it's okay for you to listen as well. But God in this passage is specifically talking to our children through what the Apostle Paul wrote through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Now before we get into the message, I have a question for you. Is there anyone in our service this morning who is 12 years old? 12 years old. Raise your hand real high if you're 12 years old. All right, I don't see anyone right at 12. Let's go to 11 or 13. Who's the closest to age 12? How old are you? 11, all right. So picture, let's see, this was uh, Luke, right? Paul, Luke, Luke, thank you. Picture Luke, all right. When's your birthday, Luke? November, no. He'll be 12 in November the 13th, so he's almost there, all right? Picture Luke as we're telling this story. Interesting story about a 12-year-old boy. This 12-year-old boy went on a trip from a small hometown to the big city with his parents. So after the trip, his parents left. They were in a whole group of people. They were with other family members, folks from their town, and they were traveling together, but they weren't actually together as a couple. So each of them thought their 12-year-old boy was with the other parent, and it turned out he wasn't. 
He had stayed behind in the big city all alone. So after a day of traveling, as they got ready for bed that night, they were a distance from home, they realized that he was missing. And as good parents would be, they were worried. Wouldn't your parents be worried if you'd been missing a whole day and they were traveling and they left you in the big city? Well, they turned around and went back to the big city, but it took another full day to get there. Then the third day, they looked everywhere for him. So you can just imagine how worried his mom and dad were. He was only 12 and he was alone in the big city. They were naturally concerned about all the bad things that could happen to him. And you can imagine how relieved they were when they finally found him safe and sound. Now, the story I've been sharing, you probably have already put together, comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 2. It's the only story we have in the Gospels about Jesus when he was a boy, not a baby. When Mary and Joseph went back to Jerusalem and found him, they found him in the temple asking and answering a lot of questions with the most renowned teachers of the Old Testament of that day. And those teachers were amazed by his knowledge. Now, we're not going to read the story, but let me share just a couple of interesting truths from that story this morning. First of all, Jesus at age 12 knew his purpose in his life and he began to fulfill it. He chose to begin to fulfill it. Let me read from Luke 2, verse 43. When they had finished the days as they returned, the boy Jesus lingered behind in Jerusalem, and Joseph and his mother did not know it. Let me jump down to verse 49. They found him in the temple. He said to them, why did you seek me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? Talking about his heavenly father. So he knew at age 12 his purpose in life, and he said, I've got to do what God has placed me here to do. But the second truth is this, Jesus, eternal deity, God the Son, chose to obey and submit himself to his earthly parents. Verse 51 of Luke 2, then he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject to them. But his mother kept all these things in his heart. Jesus at age 12, knowing full well who he was, still submitted himself to his mother and stepfather's authority. Now, is that an interesting truth or not? That's the last reference we have of Jesus' childhood. We don't know anything more about him till he began his public ministry some 18 years later at age 30. You know, it's entirely possible that he lived with his mother and submitted to her up until that time? Now, with that background about the obedience and example of Jesus, let's see what Paul has to say in Ephesians chapter 6. Now, remember, today's passage is an application of the principle that we found back in chapter 5, verse 18. In that verse, Paul commanded us to be filled with or controlled by the Holy Spirit. What does a person who is controlled by God's Holy Spirit look like? Well, verse 19 says, he has joy that shows itself in a godly songs in his heart. Verse 20 says he'll have a thankful spirit. And verse 21 says that a person who is controlled by the Holy Spirit will be submissive in his relationships. Then Paul, in the book of Ephesians, starts applying that principle of submission. Anyone who is controlled by the Holy Spirit will be submissive. And that submission is going to show itself at home. Paul has talked about relationships of the husband and the wife. He's already talked, in verse 4, he talks to parents. We looked at that last week. Today, it's time to hear what he says about spirit-filled living and submission to children. Ephesians 6, verse 1. Children, you listen? Hey, kids, listen up. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with you and you may live long on the earth. 
Now, a couple of moments ago, I was looking for someone age 12. Most of us know that a five-year-old, an eight-year-old, even a 12-year-old, most of us consider those ages to still be children. What about someone in high school? What about someone in college? Let's start this morning by answering the question, who are the children that Paul is talking to in this passage? I'm going to start, you know that the New Testament was not written in English. Back in those days, it was written in a language we call Greek. So I'm going to start with the meaning of the Greek word that's translated children this morning. In this passage, what is the meaning of the word children? Well, this particular word simply refers to someone who has been born to someone else. It's talking about an offspring, a descendant of someone. So the age is not included in the definition of the word. In fact, there are other words that deal with a very young child. In Luke chapter 15, verse 31, the prodigal son's older brother is referred to by this word. We know he wasn't a child. We know he wasn't a teen. On the other hand, at the other extreme in Greece, in, in the Greek culture, this word was used even to refer to an unborn baby. So it has a wide de range of definitions. So we can define the word children as we find it here, and here's a blank in your outline, as someone who has been born to another. Someone who has been born to, let me ask you a question. How many of you here this morning have been born to somebody? Raise your hand. I'm hoping we get everybody's attention. How many of you here say that you've been born to somebody? Raise your hand. Oh, finally got attention, good. So in that sense, we all fit with this word. It can refer to anyone here. But who does Paul have in mind when he speaks to children in this passage? Well, as we look at the context, as we look at what the whole passage is about, I think the answer is that he's referring to someone living at home under the authority and responsibility of their parents. Someone living at home under their parents' authority and responsibility. Now, I would even include someone temporarily away at a college campus that's still coming back home and mom and dad are paying the bills anyway. You may not think you're a child, but I th honestly, in this passage, I think it goes that broad. We know from Genesis chapter 2, verse 24, that that parental authority relationship that demands obedience in the home is changed when that child marries and starts their own home. A child is no longer under his or her parents' authority at that point. There might also be a, a time when a child, someone born, is still living at home, but they're living at home as an independent adult. But Paul here is talking to those under parental authority, and honestly, I think he's thinking of those who would be quite a bit older than 12 years of age. So let's go back to that first question. Who are the children? How many of you here are 12 years old or younger? Raise your hand real high, 12 years old or younger. I'm waiting to see all the hands go up. Okay, on your outline it says, who are the children? Beside that, write me. You're one of them. How many of you are 12 or older and you're still in junior high, senior high? You haven't graduated from high school yet. Raise your hand. You write the word me. He's talking to you. If you're out of school, but still living at home with mom and dad, maybe you should write the word me beside that question. The older you've gotten, the more independence you're enjoying. But if mom's still doing the cooking of your meals and washing of your clothes, if dad's still paying for your food and for your roof over your head, then you still should be under their authority. As far as I'm concerned, this passage still applies to you. Remember, the word children is not limited to those under 12 or under 18. So, now that we have an understanding of who the children are, let's move on to the second question. What are the commands? Look at verse 1 again. Children, 
Obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. We'll pause right there. Now notice Paul is speaking directly to the children. They were in the congregation when this letter was read. They were hopefully listening carefully to what God was saying through his word. So what does God say to the children? Number one, he says, listen to your parents. Now, the word translated obey is an interesting word. It's actually a compound word in the Greek language. It means you take two words and you put them together. It's made of a prefix that means under and a verb that means to listen. So literally, it means to listen from under or listen because you are under authority. There's fancy books in my library in my office called lexicons, Greek lexicons. Basically, they're books of a Greek dictionary. It gives a Greek word and tells its meaning, okay? Here's some of their definitions. Listen to a command. Obey. Submit. Be subject to comply with. So the word does carry the meaning of obey, but in order to obey, the first thing you have to do is to listen. Now, the book of Proverbs is a book of wisdom. It's also a book of instruction from a father to his son. So it's a perfect book for a child or teen or young adult to use to learn God's wisdom and to find how to make a success out of your life. So let me just share a few verses from Proverbs about listening to your parents. Chapter one, verse eight, my son, hear the instruction of your father. Do not forsake the law of your mother. Chapter four, verse one, hear my children, the instruction of a father, give attention to no understanding. Chapter four, verse 10, hear my son and receive my sayings. The years of your life will be many. Chapter five, verse seven, therefore hear me now, my children. And do not depart from the words of my mouth. Chapter 8, verses 32 and 33. Now, therefore, listen to me, my children, for blessed are those who keep my ways. Hear instruction and be wise. Do not disdain it. Chapter 13, verse 1. A wise son heeds his father's instruction, but a scoffer does not listen to rebuke. Chapter 19, verse 20. Listen to counsel. And receive instruction that you may be wise in your latter days. One more, chapter 23, verse 22. Listen to your father who begot you. Do not despise your mother when she's old. Over and over, and this isn't all of them. Over and over, Proverbs teaches us to listen. To hear instruction and then do something about what we've heard. So kids, listen up. Kids, get in the habit of listening to mom and dad. When you hear them speak, stop talking and listen. Focus your attention on their voice. Stop listening to the TV or your earbuds. Pay attention to what they're telling you. You know, God has given you your parents. And he's given your parents a job to do. That job includes instructing you. The Bible says you must listen. Let me ask you a question, kids. This is a good one. Are your parents infallible? Or another way of putting that is, do your parents ever make mistakes? Yeah, they do. God knows that. But he has established a line of authority in the home, a line of authority in his plan, and while you're at home, you are to listen. Kids, let me ask you a question. Is there ever any tension at home? Does it seem like mom and dad are always yelling at you? Let me let you in on a little secret. If you will listen and obey them the first time they say something, tell you something, you're not going to have nearly as much yelling. When you listen, they won't have to yell. So we answer the question, what are the commands? We realize the first command is to listen to your parents. But that's not the end of it. The English word in verse 1 is right on in translating what Paul is saying. You must listen, but secondly, you must obey your parents. Let's begin by talking about the command. The command could not be clearer. I mean, I don't really need to explain it, do I? The word obey comes from a root word that means to listen, but it goes much farther. It means listen and obey. Listen and do what you're told. 
And it's a command in the Greek language. It's not a suggestion for you to consider and think about and maybe reject. It's not an idea for you to decide whether you like it or not. Young people, you are commanded by God to obey your parents. It's a command. It comes from God through the Apostle Paul. Children, obey your parents. And the command's in the present tense, which in the Greek language means it's an ongoing kind of thing. The children who received this command understood that Paul was saying, children, be continually obeying your parents. It's a continuous action. It's something that you need to do all the time. So with that command, what about the extent? How much must children obey? How much? Well, the answer to that is found in another verse that is very similar to this one. Paul wrote the letter to, Coloss to, to Ephesus. He also wrote a letter to a town called Colossae in a church there. And the letters have a lot of parallels. Colossians 3.20 says this, Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. Yeah, you got it. God is commanding you to obey your parent in everything, even when you don't like it, even when you want to do something else, even when it doesn't make sense to you, even when everybody else is doing something else, even when you don't think it's fair, even when you think you're too old to be treated that way. Do you get it? Through Paul, God is saying, obey in everything. Now let me ask you, what does it mean to obey? It means to do what you're told. It means to stop doing something that you're told to stop doing. It means to obey the first time you're told to do it. It means to obey without arguing or sassing or debating or bargaining or complaining. Yeah. So that naturally brings up another question. Are there ever any exceptions? Everything I'm told? Are there ever any exceptions? And the answer is a definite yes. There are exceptions, but here they are. The only exceptions that God's word gives to God's command to submit, whether that's to children or whether that's to us in relation to the government, you know, a lot of submission statements in the God's word. We've talked about that before. But the only exceptions that God gives to the command to submit and obey are whenever that authority steps over their bounds and tells you to do something clearly contrary to one of God's other commands. Like, I want you to go do something immoral or illegal. Or I want you to worship a false god. Or I'm not going to let you worship the true God. But in a Christian home, that doesn't happen too often, does it? 99.99% .99 of the time, for most everyone here this morning, God's command is obey. Children, those living at home under their parents' authority, are commanded to listen and obey. But there's another command found in verse 2 and verse 3. You're also to have a good attitude toward your parents. Verse 2, honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with you and you may live long on the earth. Ephesians 6.2 says, honor your father and mother. The, the idea of that word honor is really the idea of valuing something. To honor your parents means show your parent their proper value or worth. Now, I know some of you may be sitting or thinking, they're not really worth that much. Oh, yeah, they are. Their, their value and worth as a parent. It means to respect. It means to revere. Show them how precious they are to you. It's obedience from the heart. Picture a child who disobeys. His dad gives him a time out. Tells him to go sit on a chair and don't move. So the child, dad's bigger, he unwillingly sits. But he mutters under his breath, 
I'm sitting on the outside, but I'm standing on the inside. That's not the right attitude. Show honor. Honor goes beyond simple obedience. We're talking about your attitude. Show respect towards your parents. Show respect even when they're not around. Show respect even when you're with your friends. Don't talk negatively about them. Don't complain about them. Show them honor. Children who are now adults, <laughs> we need to remember that honor goes beyond. We need to remember that when we establish our own homes, we still need to show honor to our parents. We no longer have to obey them in anything, in, in everything, in anything, in everything. Joanna got married last summer, a year ago, and her authority changed from me to Mark. Now she doesn't have to do whatever I tell her to do, but she still needs to honor me. She still needs to honor her mom. That means listen to counsel. You don't have to obey. We never grow too old for the idea of honoring. And that honor is possible even if a parent is not a believer, not acting like a believer. Honor them, show them respect for the position of authority that God has given them. Jesus said that honoring your parent even includes the concept of financially caring for your parent if that becomes necessary. One more thing I need to mention. In the Bible, the idea of honoring is contrasted with the idea of cursing. You honor your parents, you're not going to curse your parents. You're not going to speak evil of them. You're not going to treat them in a despicable manner. Show them honor. So God's instructions for children are really clear. These are commands that children must obey. God expects you to obey them. Children, you must listen to your parents, you must obey your parents, you must honor your parents. You need to have a good attitude toward them. But why does Paul give this counsel? Why must we honor and obey and listen to our parents? Well, first of all, it's because obedience is pleasing to the Lord. We saw that in verse 1. It says, command, commands us to obey in the Lord. Colossians tells us this is well pleasing to the Lord. When we obey our parents, kids, we're actually obeying Christ. So we're doing it with the attitude of doing what Christ wants us to do, do and serve him. It's a result of our relationship with Christ. And obedience is pleasing to Christ. It makes him happy. So why should we obey? Why should we honor? Because it's pleasing to the Lord. Secondly, because it's right. Verse 1, again, Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. You know, children are great judges of fairness. They know when something's not fair. Kids, God's plan of fairness is this. Obedience to your parents is the fair or right thing to do. God designed a world in which obedience was right and expected according to the laws that he set up. God made us and created us in such a way that we should obey. Satan's the one that tries to get us not to obey. That obedience begins at home. It's also right because God designed parents to have the authority to train their children. We see that in verse four. We talked about that last week. Parents are older. They're more experienced. Hopefully they're wiser. So listen to your parents. It's right because God said so. Third, we need to do it because obedience is commanded. The word obey, the word honor are commands. Written by Paul, recorded in scripture, inspired by the Holy Spirit, God's commands. So when we disobey our parents, we're disobeying God. We're breaking his command. When we disobey our parents, they may never find out. Usually they do, but once in a while they may not find out. But guess what? God always knows when we disobey. Obedience is pleasing to the Lord. It's right. It's commanded. And obedience brings God's blessing. Look again at verses 2 and 3. Honor 
your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise. This comes right out of the Ten Commandments in the Old Testament. There were ten commandments. The first four dealt with our relationship with God. The final six dealt with our relationship with other people. And this is the very first of that final six. Children, obey your parents. And it's the first one that has a promise connected that it may be well with you and you may live long on the earth. God's peace, God's blessing. He's saying God will prosper you. A blessing of a long life. Now, we need to remember this is a general promise for obedience. On occasion, God in his sovereignty, for reasons we don't understand, might overrule this. Don't think just because a child is involved in an accident and dies young or gets cancer and dies young that he must have not been obedient. That's not the case. We don't quite have those promises like they did in the Old Testament. But as a rule... Children who obey live longer. They don't do the things that destroys their health or destroys their lives through rebellion. Now, that promise implies the opposite. If obedience brings God's blessing, disobedience will bring his chastening, his wrath, punishment. A life lived in rebellion will result in the consequences of broken health, a difficult life, God's chastening. I want to close the sermon this morning with a true story. It's true because it happened in my ministry. All right? It's a story of a young man that I knew many years ago. A young man that I'm going to call Lenny. It's not his real name. Lenny was from a Christian home. He and his family were at church all the time. They grew up. He grew up going to church. But when Lenny got into high school, he started drifting away from the Lord. He didn't go too far at first. He just wasn't as involved. He built some wrong friendships. But he even brought some of those new friends to church occasionally. Then he graduated from high school and he had no real purpose in life. So he started getting involved with more and more problems. He even started drinking some. His parents worked with him and warned him. They prayed for him. But he wouldn't listen. Lenny thought church was boring and unreal. One night, Lenny was out with some friends. The driver of the car had had a few drinks, went too fast on a city street, you know the story. Missed the curve. Went off the road. Hit a large tree. Lenny's parents were called to the hospital, but he never regained consciousness. Lenny died. He's in eternity today because he refused to listen to and obey his parents. Hey, kids, listen up. Don't become a Lenny. Do what God tells you to in this passage. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, that it is so practical and deals with real issues of our lives. Lord, I thank you for the children that are here this morning. I thank you for those that might be watching this sermon later. But Lord, I pray that they would understand your message through the Apostle Paul, that they would take heed to that message. Father, I pray that they would submit as you have instructed them to submit. Lord, help all of us to submit in the ways that you've told us to submit. Lord, I pray that our children would come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ if they don't know him as their savior. I pray that our parents, as we spoke last week, would bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Father, bless our homes. Help our homes to be places where Jesus is honored and where the Christian life is lived, homes that are lighthouses in our community. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As I said, today is Communion Sunday. We're doing a bunch of stuff today. As we prepare for communion, we're going to transition a bit and think about our Savior and sing the old rugged cross. But as we do, if you have a spiritual need in your heart, in your life, 
We want to be a blessing to you. We want to help. I'm going to be down at the front of the church. And kids, if you have a need, you want someone to talk to you about it, you can come right now. You can talk to us after the service. Adults, same goes for you. How's your relationship with Jesus this morning? Let's stand together, please, as we sing the old rugged cross. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old cross where the dearest and best for a world of Sometimes for communion service, I like to preach a communion message, but we were in that series, so I did not do that this morning. But this is a very sacred, holy time. And we invite you to join us this morning. You don't need to be a member of the church, but you do need to make sure Jesus Christ is your Savior. We prefer that you followed him in believer's baptism. And even as Christians, we need to ask ourselves, this is a time of fellowship with our Savior. Am I in fellowship with him? Is my heart right with him. So let's bow for just a moment of silence, give you that opportunity to make sure things are right between you and the Lord before we gather around the table. Our Father, we do thank you and praise you for our Savior who loved us so much that he left the glories of heaven, came to this earth as a baby, grew up and lived a sinless life, and then took our sins upon himself and died in our place. Thank you, Lord, for what Jesus did for us. Thank you, Lord. He rose again. He's at your right hand as our great high priest, interceding for us even this morning. Lord, as we come to this table, we know that we are sinners. And Lord, we know that 
As we confess those sins, you have promised to forgive, and we thank you for that promise. Thank you for the blood of Christ. Father, speak to our hearts about Jesus' sacrifice for us. Help us to worship and praise you. Worship and praise him for all that you have done for us. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The Apostle Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. Pastor Clinton Richardson, we thank the Lord for the bread this morning. Lord, as we think about, even as we go to the sermon and our obedience to our parents, we think about all the way back at the beginning where we disobeyed you. Yet in your love and in your mercy, you sent a substitute to pay that price of disobedience. Lord, we are thankful for your shed blood, and as we are about to receive, we ask that we um, partake with a thankful heart for what you have done for us. We pray this in the name of your Son. Amen. all of it. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Rather Tim Fry, 
Would you thank the Lord for the cup this morning? Our loving Heavenly Father, we are so grateful this morning for the selfless sacrifice of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, who bore on his body our sin upon the cross and shed his blood that we might have full and free forgiveness of our sin debt. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Drink ye all of it. Apostle Paul reminds us, For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Aren't you thankful for our Savior? Thank you so much for being here this morning. I know there are some special things happening. I'm going to ask you to stand. We're going to close with our closing chorus, but I believe a few words of instruction are uh, going to be shared with us, and then we will close with our chorus freely, freely. Yes, we look forward to having those of you who will be staying for the meal. As soon as we're dismissed here after the closing chorus, make your way downstairs, find a seat, and then we will be given instructions as to service, uh, how to go through and how we're going to be served our meal. And uh, I will open down there with a uh, word of thanksgiving for the meal. So that's what uh, I have been asked to share with you. We will begin uh, at 1230. So between now and 1230, please make your way downstairs. Let's sing our closing chorus freely, freely.
are dismissed.